Natalie Jones, Executive Vice President of Meridian International Center. Thank you for joining us on our, uh, for our session, aptly named Breaking the Ice. Our team loves a good pun. Uh, the Emerging Landscape of Arctic Diplomacy, where we will explore the balance of growing environmental, economic, and security interest in the Arctic. Last year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced that the Arctic is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the planet. The melting Greenland ice sheet is the largest contributor to rising sea levels. The impact of climate change could have catastrophic consequences, not only for those in the region and island nations, but across the planet due to global ocean currents. At the same time, the warming Arctic is opening up new sea routes and easier access to oil, gas, and critical rare earth minerals. These emerging economic opportunities are drawing interest from countries that have historically not had interest in the region. And these dynamics are causing a growing concern that the peace and stability that has held firm for decades between nations could deteriorate and give way to tensions and conflict. The crisis in Ukraine has impacted this region as well. As you heard from our last panel and as Axios reported last week, scientific projects and collaborations are on hold as sanctions with Russian research institutions prevent scientists in the US, Europe, and elsewhere from working with their colleagues in Russia. Russia whose coastline accounts for over 50% of the Arctic Ocean's coastline is also chairing the Arctic Council, and that body has not met, met since the invasion. So what does this mean? We should expect a great deal of attention towards the Arctic in the coming years and an increasing focus on the need for diplomacy in the region. And a central question that leaders are going to need to determine is where is the balance between environment, climate, and sustainability on one hand and security and economic interests on the other? And this question is personal for our featured speaker this afternoon who is joining us from Quebec, Ms. Lisa coper -Qualuk. Lisa is the Vice President for International Affairs for the, Intuit, for the Inuit Circumpolar Council. The ICC is a multinational NGO that represents the 180,000 Inuit people living in the region and has permanent participant status in the Arctic Council. And in addition to her work on the ICC, Lisa is a member of a Regional Environmental Quality Commission, the co-founder of an influential NGO focused on social justice issues concerning Inuit women and children, and a karate instructor. So Lisa, thank you for being here. Thank you for traveling, and welcome to the program. Thank you so much for this very nice introduction. Nakomig ilunasi tunga suti tawa matamani tawong walok tilunga Washington mod. I thank you for making me feel welcome in my first visit to Washington. Inutitong inalimalang ako ama. Just I don't. I hope that you don't believe I'm going to speak inutitot all the way to you. So good afternoon. Ulukut. I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to share the perspective of the, of the Inuit at this important forum. I want to talk about the role of Inuit in Arctic diplomacy from three perspectives. Where we have been, where we are now, and where we may be going. You can appreciate that if this session was held two months ago, some of what, what, what I would say now would be different but some things will be the same. 
The first thing to know is that we have been engaged in Arctic diplomacy for decades. We are an international people living in four countries across the Arctic, sharing one language and one culture. 180,000 Inuit live in Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and Russia in four different political realities. Together, our lands we call Inuit Nunat, where we have lived for thousands of years. As a marine people, our lives and our culture are inextricably linked to our environment for food security, transportation needs, and mobility. The ability to move freely over the landscape is a key part of Inuit culture and an expression of sophisticated knowledge of the Inuit homeland. When we travel on the land and sea, it connects us to our ancestors. And to help non-Inuit understand the importance of sea ice, think of it as critical infrastructure. Our dependence on the environment has meant that Inuit have been on the front lines of climate change for some time. Climate change also intersects with other challenges. Contaminants released in the south travel from the globe and deposit in the Arctic leading towards some levels of chemicals. Microplastics and marine litter are an increasing threat to our ecosystem. We have been noting changes in our environment for decades. In 1977, the ICC was formed to give our people a voice in the political dialogue and research discussions that were beginning to emerge. To thrive in the circumpolar homeland, we realized, we realized we needed to speak with a united voice on issues of common concern and combine our energies and talent, protecting and promoting our way of life. At the end of the Cold War, our leaders brought our fellow Inuit in Chukotka into the fold and we were engaged in discussions that eventually led to the 1996 creation of the Arctic Council. In fact, ICC's former chair, Mary Simon, who is now Canada's Governor General, our head of state, played a key role in making sure Inuit and other Indigenous peoples were able to sit at the table with the eight Arctic states. This was groundbreaking. No other multi-governmental institution had ever welcomed indigenous peoples as equals. But our place at the table is not based on a kind gesture by Arctic states. Our participation in the Arctic Council and other international fora, such as the United Nations, where we have consultative status under the Economic and Social Council, known as ECOSOC, and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and other bodies is based on our indigenous right of self-determination. Our rights are enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I would like to uh, cite Article 18 uh, of that declaration. Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision-making matters which would affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures, as well as to maintain and develop their own indigenous decision-making institutions. In Canada, Alaska, and Greenland, our rights are enshrined in land claims settlements and other governmental arrangements. In Canada, for instance, Section 35, which we really enjoy repeating in Canada, Section 35 of the Constitution recognizes the right of Indigenous peoples to self-government. On the international stage, ICC has played a key role in pushing for treaties to control persistent organic pollutants and mercury, both of which originate in the South but are deposited in the Arctic through air circulation patterns. In fact, ICC's diplomatic efforts in concert with indigenous 
NGO and government allies were instrumental in getting the first reference to the Arctic and indigenous peoples into an international environmental agreement, the 2001 Stockholm Convention. Excuse me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing to be here, I must say. So uh, um, uh, I'm uh, pleased to share all these with you. So to continue, um, to all of our diplomatic endeavors, we bring our indigenous knowledge and deep connection with our environment. Indigenous knowledge, which we call IK for short, is a systematic way of thinking. It has developed over millennia and includes insights based on evidence acquired through direct, extensive, and multi-generational experiences and observations. The concept and importance of IK as a knowledge base is now acknowledged, for example, in reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the 2018 Agreement to Prevent Unregulated High Seas Fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean, and most recently in the International Maritime Organization. Which brings me to where we are. First, some good news. ICC recently became the first indigenous peoples organization to gain provisional consultative status at the International Maritime Organization. As the IMO's first indigenous observer, we feel the weight of how disproportionately climate change affects indigenous peoples and communities throughout the world. ICC has been encouraged at IMO meetings this year with how most states have supported the inclusion of indigenous knowledge in assessing impacts and mitigation measures to reduce underwater radiated noise from shipping. Sea ice is integral to Inuit culture, transportation, harvesting, and economy. Without it, and with it thinning, our way of life is disrupted in a profound way. Unfortunately, shipping, which often brings the necessities of life to our remote communities, and we always call it a supply line, as it brings all the many products and things that our communities need. Shipping also brings pollution, like black carbon, that can destroy our way of life. This isn't theoretical. It's a reality. So where are we going? This has always been our message at the Arctic Council. We can see where we are headed, and Arctic states like Canada and the United States have a special responsibility. Unfortunately, the world is distracted at the moment by Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine. Early last month, the other seven Arctic states, including the United States and Canada, called, called for a pause in all work involving the Russian Federation. ICC and other indigenous peoples organizations agreed. As chair of the Arctic Council until May 2023, Russia was to, was to host the biennial ministerial meeting where the leadership would have been handed over to Norway. At this point, it is very difficult to see this meeting go ahead. The Arctic Council's future is uncertain. While the Arctic Council is not a decision-making body nor a treaty-based organization, its assessments and deliberations are an important part of the discourse on the changing Arctic. Over the years, the alliances between indigenous peoples and Arctic states have further understood have furthered understanding of the Arct uh, Arctic states have furthered understanding of the important influences of the Arctic on the global climate system. We have a saying, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, meaning 
Changes in weather patterns, declining sea ice, and melting permafrost have global implications. We know the causes of these changes come from the outside. So what happens in the rest of the world affects the Arctic. However, there has always been a sense that the Arctic is not affected by the geopolitical storms that rage in other parts of the world. Perhaps it was naive to think that peaceful cooperation can continue in the Arctic, no matter what differences between the countries at the table. This has been called Arctic exceptionalism, and it seemed to apply when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. Now, Arctic exceptionalism, the idea that global geopolitical events don't interfere with peaceful Arctic cooperation, is no more. Even so, ICC remains committed to peaceful Arctic cooperation. We have said this many times. Every four years, we hold a general assembly to discuss important issues, develop and we develop a new declaration to guide ICC for the next period. We hold elections, and we celebrate our collective culture. This year, that meeting will be virtual, and our international chair will move from Alaska to Greenland. And while we don't have final wording on our declaration, I can guarantee you ICC will once again call for the Arctic to be made into a global zone of peace. The stakes are too high and the need is pressing. We must figure out a way to return to peaceful cooperation for our future and the future of our planet. Nakomik, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Yes, I'm open to questions. Hi, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Um, from our virtual audience, we have a question. The Inuit population spans over many different governing systems, as you discussed earlier, your international role. Um, can you speak to the challenges and successes in working with national governments? Oh, <laughs> well, it depends on which country you're in. Uh, yes, and I can't speak to, to my fellow Inuit uh, um, who live in Russia. I, I, I can't speak to fellow Inuit living in Greenland. I'm Canadian. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, the challenges... Um, uh, you know, we work on self-determination uh, as indigenous people. We want to uh, be part of decision-making processes. Um, we also want to have our own self-government uh, structures within our communities. So, so uh, the, the challenge uh, sometimes lies in the recognition of that right to self-determination. And then even when that uh, recognition exists, well, how will that structure be created? How are we going to work together so that we recognize each other and in the way we govern things, in the way we apply laws? How are my laws, Inuit laws, going to be applied to protect the environment, to, uh, to uh, meet out justice among our people? Um, I think this is where the challenge lies, is in um, making space for those discussions and space for creating those structures together in respectful ways so that uh, it's a win-win situation. It's not always been win-win for many decades, for hundreds of years. And so what we're starting to see is we're heading toward that uh, collaboration, that working together, to working out those those uh, structures in in an equitable in an equitable way. Hmm. 
Thank you so much for coming. I'm Paula Dobriansky. I'll be the moderator in the next panel. Yes. But I wanted to ask you, do you find that the Arctic Council is working for you? I know we've had the pandemic, so there's been a break. But I ask that because it's a unique structure. It does permit, you have uh, government officials sitting at the same table with all the indigenous. And give us a feel for that. Do you feel that it has been responsive to your needs? And is it also a chance for you to collaborate and compare experiences and uh, ideas with also other indigenous uh, uh, peoples? Yes, it is very much um, a forum in which we can um, collaborate on common issues with indigenous people, such as on uh, um, its working groups. We participate in the working groups uh, of the Arctic Council. Um, perhaps there are challenges, um, the areas of challenges in the Arctic Council is also within those working groups where, you know, we want to uh, ensure that indigenous knowledge is included in research projects, for example. Um, it has been so long that scientific knowledge and using only science as a basis of knowledge to make decisions uh, it was fallen back on for many decades. And now here we are saying, well, we have to include indigenous knowledge. And um, internationally, it has been a challenge. And this is where, um, uh, as indigenous people, uh, we work together and say, well, this is what it is. And there are easy ways to utilize indigenous knowledge uh, not not just after the fact, you know, after having done the scientific knowledge, but alongside scientific knowledge. In terms of diplomacy, um, it's a place where, you know, uh, we can express our our own indigenous concerns to the Arctic states, in order that we may also ally with them on issues of common concern. Let's say I. I'm uh, going to the International Maritime Organization, and I'm promoting the utilization of indigenous knowledge in a certain area, let's say in the assessment and, and mitigation measures of, of uh, the reduction of black carbon, let's say. But there may be certain opposing uh, states to, to what I'm offering, and those certain opposing states could be observers at the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council can be the place where we can express our concerns uh, if, if our um, opinions or suggestions are being ignored or neglected or even pushed aside. Mm. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your perspective. I think your remarks are, are the perfect segue into the next portion of our program. And to, to lead and moderate that panel, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Ambassador Dobriansky is a foreign policy expert, currently serving as a senior fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard, and is a member of the Meridian Diplomatic Engagement Advisory Committee. Uh, during her tenure as Undersecretary for State uh, of Global Affairs, uh, she uh, uh, had the Arctic issues in her very vast portfolio and spoke on behalf of the United States at the Arctic Council. So we are, are really honored to have her here today. So Ambassador Dobriansky, and I'd like to invite up the other uh, panelists as well. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Natalie, and also Lisa, for your presentation. And I'd like to thank Meridian uh, for holding uh, truly uh, a topic that really deserves uh, time for uh, debate and discussion, and I'm just so glad that Meridian has done so. So let's get underway. 
I'm going to introduce our very distinguished panel as we go along with each of them. And I want to go to Her Excellency, um, Ambassador Annika Krutnes first, who is Norway's ambassador to the United States. And you know, it's so much the case, you are the perfect person to address this issue because, first of all, uh, not only uh, is she a national security expert, but by the way, she was Norway's former ambassador to the Arctic and Antarctic affairs. So you had all of that under your wing for quite a while, and now here, fast forward to the United States. So let's begin with you, and the question I'd like to ask is, what do you see as the current situation in the Arctic today? And looking at it from the security perspective, we know that years back, uh, the Russians were uh, building a base there. Uh, there's the important issue, as we've heard, of climate change and the environmental conditions, and also something that we know you're very interested in, and that is economic development. So welcome to you, Ambassador, and over to you. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you, Natalie. And Lisa, so yes, I was Norway's representative to the Arctic Council for many years and, and had the pleasure of sitting there. And, and I know there's a lot of interaction with um, the indigenous, with the PPs, as we call them, the permanent participants. So, so that was, gave me some nostalgia. So, so thank you for that. But, um, well, um, we talk about the Arctic as if there was one Arctic. Uh, it isn't. The Arctic is huge, is enormous. Uh, in Norway, 10% um, of the population live north of the Arctic Circle. We have more than half a million people living there. I know in Canada, you have like 150,000 people or something north of the Arctic Circle. We have many people there. Um, we have big cities. We have 5G, we have buses, we have universities. So it's not that all ice and, and polar bears. We're actually people there, um, <laughs> such as me. Um, so you asked about climate. Um, as we heard, uh, the temperature is warming twice as fast than elsewhere. The ice is melting. Uh, the thundra is, uh, tundra is thawing. Uh, the fish are migrating. Uh, this is, at least, yeah, this is probably the most um, serious security threat to the Arctic, uh, the climate change, at least on a, a long horizon. I would say it is. Um, and. Um, there was also this question about economic activity and how, how do we manage the climate versus the economic activity. We cannot do that. We cannot put them up against each other. They have to go together. We have to use our economic activity in a way that um, we mitigate climate change. Uh, we've always lived from the sea. Um, fisheries. Uh, then oil and gas. We have a significant oil and gas production in Arctic waters. Um, we're the second biggest producer in Europe after Russia of gas. And, and right now, nobody in Brussels complain about us producing gas. <laughs> Just a few months ago, that was different. <laughs> um, but, but we also see uh, we need to shift to a green economy. Uh, so we are focusing also in the Arctic on starting up uh, green tech, hydrogen, we have battery production. So, so we have, we're in that transition to a green economy in the Arctic. But we need to have some economic activity in the Arctic because we live there. So we cannot be a museum. And then um, for the security, the military security, because as I said, the security is climate security, it's economic security, is the possibility to live there. But if you ask about the military security, yes, there was a build up. Uh, and the Russians have been building up their military structures for the last decades. Uh, they have the northern fleet just across the border from Norway at the Kola Peninsula. Um, and of course, that has led to a build up on our side as well. Um, we have a border with Russia. Uh, we are a NATO member. Uh, we've been that since the very beginning of NATO. We like to say that we are NATO's ears and eyes in the north. We keep an eye on what is going on there in those waters. And, and we have been a foreigner in NATO for increasing uh, deterrence and, and defense in the north. Um, we increase our own capabilities. We bought 52 F-35s. 
We bought P-8s, the, the maritime uh, surveillance uh, aircrafts. We will buy new submarines. We're trying to do our part uh, to defend the northern flank. Um, but yes, there has been a militarization of the Arctic. The situation in Ukraine, um, we have not seen a spillover to, um, to the Arctic, to the high north. Uh, but it's impossible to, to tell how this will develop. It is difficult to totally decouple uh, the North Atlantic and, and the Arctic from Ukraine. It's impossible to trust the Russians. Um, so how this will develop is, is too early to say. Let me just ask you a, a, a brief follow-up question and then go to Admiral Bushman. But um, Lisa mentioned the issue of Russia being the chair and Norway is the next chair. Um, can you at least spotlight, uh, assuming things go forward smoothly with your chairmanship, meaning getting into your chairmanship, um, what will be your priorities um, uh, during your chairmanship? What would you like to see get done? Uh, we would focus on climate mitigation, adaptation, um, on people, people living in the Arctic, and probably on the blue economy. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, Admiral, let me go to you. Uh, we're going to hear from Vice Admiral Scott Bushman, who is the Deputy Commandant for Operations, the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, will you give a spotlight on what the role of the Coast Guard is, because it plays a very important and invaluable role up in the Arctic. And then I can't help myself in saying this, the title of our session is Breaking the Ice. What are you doing? Could you give us the update on how you're breaking the ice with those Ice cutters, <laughs> please. Thanks, Ambassador. <laughs> uh, so the United States Coast Guard has uh, been operating in the Arctic for, for over 150 years. And they're recognizing the, the changing conditions uh, in the Arctic and increased activity in the Arctic. Uh, in 2013, we published an Arctic strategy, first time ever. And then in 2019, we really actually updated that. So just about six years later, we updated that. So as it relates to you know, our, our responsibilities and our role, let's maybe start off with Alaska, right? Because uh, Alaska is what gives the United States its status as an Arctic nation. So we have significant responsibilities up there like any other parts. Um, about 10% of our real estate in, in the Coast Guard is, is in Alaska. And, uh, but there's, there's a lot of Alaska, a lot of water out there. Um, as conditions are changing, in, in 2008, we started a, a, a seasonal presence in the Arctic, uh, in Alaska, with ships, with aircraft. Uh, we also talk a lot about uh, a mobile presence. So as you see, additional activity up in the Arctic, whether it's economic activity, whether it's tourism, whether it's shipping, uh, where there's U.S. waters and where there's activity in U.S. waters, we have responsibilities. So you'll hear us talk a lot about a mobile presence. Um, and that really brings me to your question about icebreakers. The nation has uh, two large icebreakers. One's a heavy, we call it a heavy icebreaker. Um, that's over 40 years old. And we have a, another icebreaker, a medium icebreaker that uh, supports a lot of important science. That's uh, a little over 20 years old. So we've had a lot of focus on replacing those icebreakers, what we call recapitalizing them. So very pleased that we have, uh, we have that project underway. We're, gonna, we're about ready to start building. We have a contract to water for a polar security cutter. It'll be the first uh, heavy icebreaker this nation's built in every 40 years. We're very excited about that. Got great support here within uh, the administration and, and Congress for that very, very important program that built our Navy's first icebreaker that gives us this mobile presence as, uh, as conditions change. And then I would also say, I think another important role uh, of the United States Coast Guard is, um, is really, uh, I guess I would call strategic leadership, right? Um, how we govern our own waters, be, being a model of behavior of how you uh, govern waters. Uh, we try very hard to do that. Uh, we're very active in, in the international forums we talked of, um, both bilaterally and, and multilaterally, and, and really try to be an example for um, how you uh, govern your own waters to ensure uh, the safety and security and, and the Arctic remains peaceful. Any 
Let me follow up on the question of the uh, icebreakers, because I know there's been a bit of a debate about that. There are some who say we really need to increase the number. Others say, no, it's not necessary because we have partnerships with other Arctic Council countries. And, you know, it works out. Give us a flavor for that, especially in terms of search and rescue and how, you know, if we have to depend on some others for assistance up in the Arctic when that kind of situation arises. So I'd say that, uh, you know, the Arctic would be characterized by uh, certainly the tyranny of distance and uh, the tyranny of the elements. Um, and, you know, it's very hard to build uh, permanent structures up there given the changing conditions, certainly as permafrost changes. That's why we really focused on this uh, mobile presence as conditions change and allow us to go. I would also say that uh, from a, you know, Coast Guard perspective, uh, we talk about exerting leadership. And I think in order to exert leadership, you need to have uh, presence. And really that presence in the Arctic, um, these icebreakers are really uh, much of our operational presence in the Arctic that allows us to uh, not only um, govern our own waters uh, and govern them responsibly, but uh, to work with uh, uh, like-minded nations like we do with our, with our, uh, as our, our ships and, and icebreakers. So. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Admiral. Um, let me introduce uh, James, uh, Jim, I'm gonna call you DeHart who is the U.S. coordinator for the Arctic region at the State Department. Um, let's go to the Arctic Council because that is where diplomacy is conducted, at least in the State Department uh, for the uh, United States is the uh, representative there. Um, give your perspective on where you see the, the Arctic Council now, and especially in light of you know, what's taking place with Russia. But also, what are U.S. priorities? It's uh, useful to, to hear where and what our priorities are now and what they would be in the council. Right. Um, Ambassador Dobrowski, thanks. And thanks to Meridian for, for having all of us. Great to be here with the representatives of a great NATO and Arctic ally in Norway and great interagency partner in the Coast Guard. And to have Lisa's voice um, uh, as well. So uh, Arctic has traditionally been a realm of, of cooperation, including with Russia, where we've been able to keep tensions low and uh, cooperation high. And a lot of that has taken place through the Arctic Council, uh, which brings together the eight Arctic states and also the uh, indigenous communities from across the region, uh, in the, uh, represented by the permanent participants. Um, and that's the way that we have uh, liked it. Um, you know, we've done that cooperation at the same time that we've paid attention to security uh, in the region. Uh, and um, uh, our concerns about Russia are not brand new. Uh, we've been concerned about Russia's military buildup in, in the Arctic for many years and its refurbishment of Arctic military bases and, and new capabilities up there. Uh, lack of transparency in its exercises, some unprofessional behavior by its forces in the region. and so. Those concerns are, are, are not brand new. Um, we've also had concerns about uh, 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 the PRC's interest in the Arctic and trying to get a hold of critical infrastructure and get a, get a foothold across uh, the region. And we, we work together with our allies uh, through NATO, through NORAD, with Canada, through bilaterally to address those. So, you know, we've had this cooperation and, and dealing with the security challenges side by side. Um, when Secretary Blinken went to the last Arctic Council ministerial in Reykjavik, you know, he acknowledged the geopolitical competition but said our goal is, is uh, cooperation. He really highlighted the cooperation. Um, but now we've had uh, Russia's uh, completely unnecessary, unprovoked war of choice against Ukraine, uh, which is not only brutal against uh, civilians but um, is a flagrant violation of all the principles that we that we hold very dear. Uh, you know, it, Russia's credit rating was reduced to junk status uh, several weeks ago. I would say their standing in the Arctic is, has a similar uh, reduction, um, not unlike that, um, that reduction. Uh, you know, because the Arctic is a place of, of international law and rules. Um, and so how do, you, how, how do they speak with any credibility? So for that reason, uh, we paused uh, the, the seven like-minded Arctic governments came together, decided to initiate a pause in the Arctic Council 
because we won't be convened by Russia, which currently holds uh, the, ch the chair of the council. Um, and now we're gonna have to figure out how to carry on this very important um, work that we do in the council and more broadly, um, and for now without Russia at the table, but figure out how to do this also in a way that preserves the Arctic Council for the future because we're not trying to con reconstitute the membership. Um, but we have to implement this pause now and work through it. Let me uh, do a follow-up about uh, U.S. priorities. I understand that there was a bipartisan group of senators who sent a letter to Secretary Blinken and asking for clarification on U.S. Uh, strategy in the Arctic and that it's been defined as kind of a holistic approach. Uh, tell us more about that. What is that about? Yeah, so um, we're supporting right now uh, the White House effort to uh, uh, put in place to update the national strategy for the Arctic region. Um, and um, State Department, Coast Guard, others, we all have a voice in the development of that strategy, which I think will be released sometime in the fairly near future. And then we will take our marching orders at state from that strategy. But, you know, we've got to, in terms of some priorities, we've, we've got to figure out how to how to maintain the Arctic Council as the region's premier forum and make that successful transition to the uh, Norwegian chairmanship. Uh, I think we've got to figure out how to do better encouraging high standard investment across the Arctic region, including uh, in our own state of Alaska, uh, so that we're helping people with livelihoods and we're providing alternatives to, to low-grade investment by um, Chinese state-owned uh, companies. Uh, we've got to, I think more broadly, we've just got to prepare for, you know, for a region that's going to transform um, in a dramatic way in the coming 10, 20 years. And so we've got to plan for the long term and invest in things like the deep draft port in Nome, Nome Alaska, and a whole variety of other steps that we need to take to prepare. Okay. I'm going to ask uh, the panel uh, another round of questions briefly and then be thinking of your questions. I'm going to be coming to you. So please be thinking of it because we want to hear your, uh, your comments and questions. Um, let me go to you, Jim, and also Ambassador. A question for both of you. Uh, China is an observer. How does the United States and how does Norway view China and China's interaction in an in observer capacity in the Arctic Council? Uh, what have been the pros? Have there been any cons? Uh, Jim, I'm going to go to you first, and then we'll go to the ambassador, if that's all right, because you're looking at the ambassador. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to you first, and then the ambassador, and we'll work our way down. Yeah, my instinct is to be polite. Okay. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, look, so I think, um, you know, China aspires to have a role in the Arctic. I, th I think um, if, if you listen to the Chinese narrative, it would have you believe that the Arctic is a place of sort of ungoverned space and resources up for grabs. And so, you know, if there's not enough governance there, therefore they can sort of have a role in shaping that governance, including through the um, Arctic Council. The, the reality is that there's a lot of rules, a lot of international law in the Arctic and sort of fundamentally the law of the sea and, and all that is derived from that. Um, and it's not ungoverned uh, space. Um, and there is, you know, and it starts of course with the national sovereignty of the, of the states in the region. So, uh, you know, our view towards um, uh, China's uh, participation is, is they've, they've, like everybody else, they've got to adhere to the rules. Um, if, if they do that, um, that's fine, and, uh, but you know, it's the, it is the strong existing rules um, in the region that, that matter to us and protect our interests. All right, Ambassador, what's Norway's view? No, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to, to Jim for stating uh, my favorite statement, that there is no legal vacuum in the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> it is actually a mechanism for governing the Arctic. Um, well, we see, we see an increased interest from China in the Arctic. We've seen that for, for the last decade. Um, we see them primarily uh, interested in resources. Um, we believe that's their main reason for being so interested. 
We see they got a foothold in Russia because Russia is broke. Uh, so they need Chinese investment for, for their big projects like the LNG projects in Yamal. Um, uh, but I also uh, agree with Jim that uh, it's okay to have them as an observer to the Arctic Council because we, the Arctic states, define and own the Arctic Council. And that's also one of the reasons that I think the Arctic Council, yes, it has a pause now, uh, but we shouldn't let that pause go on forever because uh, we, we have to discuss among us, but we it's not in our interest that other for us pop up where Arctic is being discussed. Uh, it's better to keep it um, in the family, as we say. I think there's more potential in the Arctic Council for involving um, uh, observers um, in a productive, constructive way where they have to commit a bit more. Just one example, the Arctic sta states, the eight of us, have agreed that we will report once a year on our methane emissions. Why don't we ask the observers to do the same? Why don't we ask China and India to report on their methane emissions? That would be something, because we know the ice is melting because of emissions, but not only emissions in the Arctic, emissions globally. So that's a global problem that has to be solved globally. So we need China to report on their emissions, as well as India, etc. Thank so you. we can use that. We can use the observer status to ask something from them. Th thank you both. Uh, Admiral, uh, let's talk about science, uh, something that I know uh, you're very interested in. Uh, how does that factor into your decision making and in terms of Arctic diplomacy, the importance yeah. of science? Yeah. So I, I think we have, a, again, a, a, I would say a long standing history of supporting science. Um, and I would say that science in the United States uh, that we support is coordinated, you know, through the National Science Foundation, the Arctic Research Commission. I talked a little bit about our icebreakers. You asked me about that before. We have uh, our medium icebreaker, the Healy, that was really a purpose built to support science. Um, and a number of ways that's really important as uh, some of these areas are uncharted, if you really want to keep the area safe and secure. Um, understanding, you know, some of the uncharted areas a little bit better. As Lisa said, you know, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So understanding the dynamics of what's happened in the Arctic science is very, very important. Just this past year, our, our this Coast Guard Cutter Healy's, uh, its home port is in uh, Seattle. It circumvented, circumnavigated North America um, through the Northwest Past and supported really some incredible science. Um, um, and there was, the science community on there from whether well, it's US, not only US scientists, but from academia and even from the international community. So that's one way we support science. I'd say another way is through some of these bilateral and multilateral forum, the Arctic Council, for example. Um, there's some important work that's being done. There's some of the work groups that so we support the Department of State and some of the work groups. There's an environmental preparedness, uh, prevention, and response work group that we're participating in that has, does some important work in terms of. Um, oil spill research that you see more activity. So that's another way we also support science um, and it's so, so important to understand the area a little better for, for many different reasons that we just talked about. So. Okay, so. great, thank you. Well, let's go to uh, the audience, uh, both here and also our virtual audience. Questions, yes, we have a question right, uh, sorry, I was gonna go right back there, row two, and then we'll come row one, and then I think it's like one line. If you'll introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, Rafael Jornal of the Fletcher School. Um, Admiral, this is for you, sir. Um, we talked a lot about the Arctic Council. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, if anything's happened with the Arctic Coast Guard Forum? Because I feel like that's kind of where the rubber meets the road in the Arctic, and whether or not anything is still happening with the forum right now, uh, despite the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And if you don't mind, if we bring the Oops, we bring the mic here to the gentleman in front here. Yes, Admiral, if you would. So the question was, okay, am I on here? I don't think I'm on. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is about the Arctic Coast. For those that are not familiar with the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, uh, the Arctic uh, Coast Guard Forum was established in, uh, in 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was really as a way to, um, I would say, um, operationalize some of the work that's done at the Arctic Council. So it's separate from the Arctic Council, but certainly related to it. The chairmanship of that, uh, of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum rotates uh, along with the, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, so we participate, participated in that in 2015. And uh, similar to the um, Arctic Council, our, our work 
uh, with the, uh, uh, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum is our participation in that along with the seven, uh, six other nations um, has paused um, and, and is consistent with uh, uh, the Arctic Council, so. All right, thank you for that. Uh, you have a question here and then I think you did right back there, please. Uh, I think it's on. If you'll introduce yourself, I said. Uh, Justin Margolis, the governor of Quebec. Thank you, Madam. I'm giving you Washington. <laughs> My question is in a personal capacity, and it's with regards to the possible adhesion of Finland and Sweden to NATO. How would that be seen from an Arctic point of view when you have the seven non Russian countries in the group that are military aligned? Okay, great. Thank you. So, Ambassador, let's hear from you, and let's hear from you, Jim. Ambassador, let's go to you first this time. Um, yes. Um, well, um, the Arctic Council itself uh, does not discuss security policy. So, so security policy would be a question for NATO. So, so, I mean, Sweden and Finland, it's up to them whether they want to join NATO. We would welcome them, uh, but it's absolutely up to them uh, whether they want to join or not. Um, and um, then they would be part of the security discussion in NATO, uh, which is where we discuss the security, the military security also for, for the Arctic. Jim? Yeah, I think I would just add, you know, Finland, Sweden, great, great uh, members of the Arctic Council, which does not do military security. Um, also, uh, great and extremely close partners to NATO already. Um, you know, uh, as Ambassador Kruten has said, really, we're going to uphold the principle that they choose their own destiny. They choose where they want to be in the world and what alliances to join. All right. Thank you. You have the next question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Lindsay Rodman. I'm a global fellow at the Wilson Center. And uh, my question is actually about if the, uh, if the Arctic Council or perhaps another body, although you've mentioned that you'd prefer it be through the Arctic Council, is able to meet with Russia in absentia. Are there actually policy opportunities there for cooperation and collaboration in the Arctic that might move matters forward and then Russia might have to embrace the Arctic consensus if they wanted to be welcomed back? All right, thank you. I'm gonna ask all three of you if you'll add that. Shall we start with you, Jim? Just go down the row. I'll be honest, I'm not sure I quite understood the beginning of your question. It, could you just clarify? So, so if the Arctic Council yep. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a really a difficult question to answer and hard to speak in terms of hypotheticals on this one. You know, I've, I've been asked, well, what does it take, right, to restore the cooperation? What do you need to see from Russia? Um, it's, it's hard to answer that because we're in such a fluid situation and we don't know what the future will bring internationally. We don't know how this crisis and Russia's aggression is gonna sort of play out. Um, so I think, to a certain extent, we're going to have to know it when we see it. Okay. Ambassador, would you like to add anything in yeah, that role? I'll, I'll just add that uh, the common challenges we have as Arctic Council, uh, as Arctic countries, uh, those challenges don't disappear, uh, even though Russia cannot help us solving them for the moment. Uh, so we will have to continue. Uh, and, and there is so much science, so much research, so many programs, so many projects going on that we can continue them without Russia. You asked about policy making, that is a different subject and I agree with him. It's all hypothetical, we'll have to see. But, but I hope that the work on Arctic issues can continue also without Russia. Admiral, anything to add? I, I would just say, you know, we coordinate uh, Arctic activities in the U.S. government through the interagency and certainly as it relates to the Arctic Council thing, we are in close call, uh, communication with everyone, and we follow the lead of our uh, colleagues at the Department of State. So, so. Okay. so I'll defer to Ms. Mr. DeHart here. So. Okay. Well, I, I wanted you to jump in because I think also the dynamic among right. the three of you, you know, is I think important for the audience to take in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question in the back, and if you'll introduce yourself. Yes, uh, Larry Mayer, Director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire, and a question for Admiral Bushman. Uh, we talked earlier today about um, how critical understanding the Arctic is with respect to climate change issues and many others. 
Um, and you mentioned about how the Healy has been supporting science in the Arctic for a number of years now. But I'm wondering how well equipped the new polar security cutters are going to be to continue that level of support of science. Our polar security cutters are going to be uh, what we call multi-mission platforms, so they'll be able to support many, many different missions. I'd also say that uh, as it relates to our polar, we're talking about the Arctic here, obviously an important issue, but we also, uh, our, our, our polar cutter is also deployed to support science in Antarctic as well. Uh, important mission to support the National Science Foundation. Our uh, one heavy icebreaker polar star just literally just returned from Antarctica to, to support uh, the National Science Foundation, our interest there to kind of break that out and be able to resupply that too. So it's not just the Arctic, but, but the Antarctic as well. So. Well, let me, we've come to the two o'clock hour. Uh, let me first uh, thank all of you for your good, great questions. And then I especially, I do want to thank our very distinguished uh, panel. Um, uh, Ambassador, thank you. Uh, Jim, if I may uh, call you informally, and Admiral, uh, each of you have really pre presented, I think, a different angle, I mean, a common, uh, 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 I'd say substantive uh, angle, but also from different seats in which you're sitting in. But I'd like to just conclude by the way I began, which is thanking Meridian for holding this. And one of the fundamental reasons why, I think you can hear from all of the comments and starting with Lisa's uh, formal remarks, the importance of the Arctic, certainly to the indigenous uh, people uh, in uh, all of the Arctic countries is crucial in terms of how the environment is impacting these communities, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges. You also have heard the security concerns that we have, which we all share as to what it portends. And then no less the economic and commercial uh, interests with the melting of the ice. There's competition afoot there. Uh, and then um, uh, no less uh, the uh, environmental uh, concerns uh, that exist. So with that, please join me in thanking this very distinguished panel and Meridian. <laughs>